All right, how are you all doing seventh grade? Um, I am home right now recording this slideshow. I've never done this before, but I think it's gonna work out. Um, I hope you all are doing well. I'm home, uh, just chilling out with Cala, having a great week. I'm at home with the baby. Uh, but I thought I wanted to, to you know, go ahead and continue with this curriculum because I think it's gonna be a really fun day for you. And um, I'm hoping that with this sort of slideshow overview, you're gonna get a sense of what shutter speed is and um, have a really fun day working with cameras and light. So just to go over what you're going to do today, um, I want you to be in groups, small groups at your tables, uh, watching this slideshow and discussing in your groups, and then hopefully you'll kind of bring it back to a, a brief sort of whole group discussion. So hopefully in about 30 minutes you're going to get kind of a, a, an understanding of what shutter speed is and what you're going to be doing today. Um, after that, I want you to um, be experimenting with lights. About 30 minutes, you're going to be just with the whole class, uh, with the lights out, using your flashlights, your headlamps, hopefully you brought those in, and hopefully taking some really cool pictures with light. Uh, and then the last 30 minutes or so, you're going to be importing your, importing your images to iPhoto, and then briefly going over your photo homework. Um, yeah, photo homework, but don't worry, it's not that much. It's just a, just taking some pictures for, t for tomorrow's class so you can edit um, and hopefully working with some of these shutter speed concepts we're going to go over. Uh, if for some reason you don't have time for the importing the iPhoto, if it, if it actually takes the whole class to just do the slideshow and, and the exper experimenting with light, taking the photos, that's okay. Just hopefully um, you, there will be time for you to go over the homework so you do take the pictures for tonight. Uh, or for tomorrow's class. So uh, one thing I've learned is that when you're recording, it doesn't seem like you can really go back and um, and edit your your voiceovers for every slide. So uh, I'm going to try to make a, a clean run of it, and uh, and I'm going for it. Here we go. All right. So uh, shutter speed. So just a, a brief explanation of what shutter speed is. Is this that curtain? Um, I like to think of it as a curtain that opens and closes, so it's letting light into your camera. So just going, you know, backing up, thinking about everything about photography is about balancing light. That um, the whole purpose of the camera is it's it's trying to figure out how much light's coming into the camera so it doesn't overexpose or underexpose the image. Um, if you kind of go back to when we started photography a while back, we talked about the underexposed and, and overexposed images. And um, if you overexpose something, you, you let too much light in, so it essentially kind of burns out the image. You get an all-white image. I know that we've all done that before, and it's frustrating. And then conversely, if you underexpose something, you're not letting enough light in, so everything's going to be dark. Um, so your whole goal is to find that proper balance. And shutter speed is one of the factors. We'll go over all of the factors again. Um, shutter speed and aperture are, are two things that work together. Um, but today we're going to focus only on shutter speed. And shutter speed is, um, is really going to influence blurred or frozen motion. So um, to, to think about it, when you take a picture, you hear that sound. You hear that click-click or that ch -ch something of that nature. And that, that is the, the shutter speed. That is the curtain that's opening and closing. Um, and what's really important is that shutter speed is based on time. So that curtain can open for a really long period of time, letting a lot of light in or it can open and close for a very brief amount of time, uh, letting a smaller amount of light in. And, I mean, the, the time is actually, it's pretty variable. It goes from something, you know, you can go for, from like one one thousandth of a second to um, something like a full second. And what they really do is they're going to affect how you capture subjects, um, especially if they're moving. And it's also important to note that it's very sensitive, too, to your movement as a photographer. So you, if you have a really slow shutter speed, um, even just you holding the camera can blur what you're trying to take a picture of. So hopefully you're going to understand through the slideshow, um, you know, where you might need to use a tripod and, um, and what's happening when things are blurry or when there's maybe too much light coming in. So uh, just to go over the basics, and every camera is different, but there is some consistency. So on your mode dial, I know on the school cameras there's the mode dial on top that gives you all the choices. Most cameras are on top. Um, that if you look on the mode dial, there's something called shutter priority. So if you turn your little the little dial to S, it's mostly S on most cameras. On some cameras, you'll see a TV, and the T stands for time. Um, so a good way to remember that it's a time setting that's the, the speed at which it's opening and closing. So that setting, if you put it on that setting, what happens 
is it allows you to adjust the shutter speed and then the camera is going to automatically change everything else, all the other settings, the aperture, the ISO, the film speed, and it's going, going to give you a properly exposed picture um, with your chosen, your chosen shutter speed. So today, when you do your experimenting, I want you to play with that shutter priority, the, the, put the dial on the S or the TV. Um, second part, shutter is usually expressed by a fraction, uh, which is a fraction of a second the shutter is open. So if you see 60 as your setting on your screen, what it really is saying is that it's a 60th of a second. Um, or it could be 240, which is a 240th of a second. Now, um, this can keep on getting slower and slower. It can be one half, which is a half of a second. Um, mostly they're really fast. They're, it's, a, it's a fast number um, or a fast you know, amount of time. Um, if you keep on dialing it slower and slower and slower, you can get whole second exposures. You can do one second, eight seconds. Um, these are very, very slow and require tripods because they're so slow that any sort of motion, just the slight movement of your hand is going to make it blur. Um, also, on that setting, you might see one with a little, um, with exclamation, or, or not exclamation points, what do you call them, the uh, quotations. It might be one with a quotation. That usually means that it's a full second exposure, or if you see a two with a quotation mark, it's, an, it's a two second exposure. So that's sometimes how you know. You also will know just by, by hearing it. You know, if you, if you have a three second or four second exposure, when you push the button down, you will hear it open. So there'll be like two or three seconds in between. Um, really important, the last one, I'm going to slow down, make sure everybody hears this, but one over 60 or a 60th of a second is generally the slowest setting where you can hand hold the camera without camera shake or blur. Um, so if you think at a 60th of a second, a tripod is usually required. So um, anything slower than that, anything slower than the 60th of a second, you might need to brace your camera. Um, sometimes you can brace it on a rock, I hope maybe you guys have all done this, or a table, um, or if you have a tripod, you hook it up to a tripod. Now you can, you can, at a 30th of a second, you can be really still, sometimes take a breath and, and hold your camera as still as you can, and you can get a crisp image. Um, but just think about that 60th of a second as sort of a good rule um, for, you know, you're kind of at that edge of where things might start blurring. And the, really the important part is if things start blurring, you know why they're blurring and you can change it if you need to. All right, so let's get into examples of what, um, of what these things can do. So frozen motion. Um, one of the coolest things that photography is able to do is freeze, freeze action in time. Uh, this is a really, really cool image um, from a pioneer of photography. Uh, Harold Egerton. Um, he basically would set up in his studio these different, um, you know, he, would, he basically had a gun on a tripod with a trigger to a string and he was trying to freeze the motion of something as fast as a bullet, which he was able to accomplish through a lot of different photos. One is kind of going through an apple. This is a really um, awesome photograph where it's a picture of a bullet slicing through a playing card. Um, so, you know, this is, in, in terms of how fast that shutter speed can go, this really shows you uh, what is possible and that you're able to freeze something that fast. I mean, it, I'm sure it took him, you know, tons and tons of takes to, to finally get it in the right frame. Um, but this is an example of frozen motion. Here's another one that shows you how you can kind of take things that maybe are moving really, really fast, really, really quickly, and through photography you can freeze them. Um, this is this, this picture of these two um, finches fighting, black and white uh, photo from 1936. Uh, here's a uh, Bresson photo, really, really famous photo. And it also shows you how you can yield these really, really awesome kind of poetic um, results thinking about time. Uh, you look at this picture and this, this perfectly undisturbed glassy surface of water and that heel is just about to touch down and break that stillness. And it's just, it's, there's a lot of tension in that moment. And that's all achieved through, um, you know, the sh a shutter speed is, is part of it where uh, he was able to freeze that motion in time just at that moment. So um, it can really yield a really powerful moment if you can freeze that right moment. Again, we're, at, we're talking about frozen motion right now. This is all about freezing time. 
So a really great example of frozen motion is thinking about sports photography. Um, I would say the majority of sports, sports photographs are, are focusing on freezing, freezing action. Uh, this is a really sort of famous image of Michael Jordan um, at the slam dunk contest where he dunked from the free throw line. But the photographer here had a fast enough shutter speed where nothing's blurry. You see that he is crisp, the ball is crisp, the, the rim, all the crowd, everything's in focus. And it looks like he's just kind of stuck floating in midair and you get the sense of how high he is in the air and how far he's jumped. Um, so again, frozen motion is routinely used in sports photos. Here's a more recent example from last year from the NFC um, championship game, that really awesome play. Um, and it kind of just underscores how photography can literally freeze a moment in time that you, you know, you remember that moment, but you see it frozen in time through these photographs. Um, so again, it's this faster shutter speed that is actually freezing, um, freezing action. So think of that shutter just going really fast. Um, this is a photographer who actually plays with the concept a little bit in that it, they, they look like they're frozen in time, but they're actually staged. I just threw this in there because I thought it was kind of fun that, um, that these, these uh, photographs are actually you know, rigged up where the, the people who are falling sometimes are harnessed in, then in Photoshop, those things are removed or the ladder's actually suspended somehow. So it's all tricking you into thinking they're frozen. Um, just thought I'd throw it in as sort of a fun example of how you can play with space, play with time, um, and play with people's sort of expectations of things moving. I mean, it'd be remarkable for her to continuously capture these moments, but she sets them up and makes them happen. All right, so back to this original image that I showed you at the very beginning, blurred motion, to kind of thinking about, you know, how this photo might be playing out. Um, this this photo here was taking at one, taken at 1 20th of a second. So... Um, they were able to, to, to capture this moment where the train is moving really, really fast. So with a slower shutter speed at 1 20th, just a reminder that at 1 60th is that kind of last, uh, you know, setting where you can handhold the camera. So at 1 20th, it's slower than that, where that train is going to be, you know, zipping by and blurry, but the person waiting on the platform isn't really moving that much. So at 1 20th of a second with a tripod or some sort of brace, the photographer was able to capture her standing there crisp and then the train blurring. So it's a really purposeful effect that really emphasizes the speed of the train moving by. So, um, you know, think about those moments where you can actually use a tripod or use some sort of a brace to juxtapose these, um, juxtapose action really, juxtapose one thing moving really quickly, another thing really, really still. Here's an example of um, something we're going to talk about called panning, which is basically the opposite of this, where you, um, instead of letting the thing move and trying to, to focus on something that is still and something moving behind it, you have something that's actually moving in space and you're following that thing with your camera. So what ends up happening is that you blur the background by your own movement. So you're not using a tripod. You're actually moving the camera along with something. So in this case, if you can imagine the photographer is taking a photo of this lamp that's probably just swinging like a pendulum on its cord, and the photographer is rocking the camera back and forth, following the, or tracking the, the light, and then what's happening is the background is blurring. So it yields this really cool photo where the light is pretty much in focus, and then the background is blurred. Um, another kind of example of how you can play with motion. This photographer, she um, is riding a bike, essentially, and using a slow shutter speed. And if you get the sense that the world looks like it's moving past really, really quickly, um, because on the bike, the camera is a little bit more still, so you get the handlebars that are, are in, in focus, or are roughly in focus but then what's moving around here looks like it's going really fast. I mean, the, the more you look at this photo, it's kind of, it has kind of a dizzying effect. Again, all playing with shutter speed, slowing things down to blur things on purpose. And I think that that emphasis is on blurring something on purpose and really being intentional about what is blurred, what is not blurred. When everything is blurry, you know, sometimes it, it might just seem like things were just all blurry. But if you really do it with some intention, it can be really, really, really interesting. 
So back to this idea of panning that I, I mentioned with that lamp swinging. So the idea here is again that you um, you could take this this photo here two ways. One, you could um, set a tripod up or um, or brace the camera, and you could try to take a picture of that that buggy moving by really quickly, and it would blur the buggy. Or the other idea is that you don't use a tripod and you actually follow moving across, you follow that buggy with your camera trying to mimic the same pace and you try to focus on that buggy while blurring the background. Um, it's, it's something that takes practice and, and it takes you taking a lot of pictures to yield uh, the one that you really like. It's you know through doing this panning thing you make a lot of mistakes which is totally fine. You just have to take a lot of pictures and you'll get you'll hopefully get one that looks really cool. These are instructions on how to pan. If you want to uh, look them over later, I, mean, I don't want to go too, into too much detail right now about panning, um, but if you want to look them over later and give it a try, feel free to read through them. Uh, I want to move on to what um, we're going to be doing today. So today's project is, is drawing with light. So essentially, you are going to be experimenting with slow, slow shutter speeds. And again, experimenting. So I want you to, to work with changing that setting. Slow it down to a really, really slow exposure. Uh, maybe, you know, four seconds, uh, maybe two seconds. You have to find the right balance, something that's going to really, really um, allow you to um, move light around so it's blurred and you can draw with it. Um, you don't want it to be too slow or actually it'll still overexpose the image. Um, or if it's too fast, you're just going to get something that is black because it's not letting enough light in. So we'll talk about that a little bit, but drawing with light is the name of the game. It's really fun. Um, so what you're going to be doing, you are going to divide yourselves into groups of three or four. So I think it might be easy if you just stick with your table groups. Um, and make sure there's at least one light source in your group. Hopefully you've all brought lights and the more the better. So. Um, but if for some reason there's one person or, or there's one table or there's group, a group that doesn't have any light source amongst the three or four of you, um, try to communicate with another group and borrow a light or um, talk with Sarah, see if she has some of the extra lights that are in the class. So at least you have at least one light source. Um, then all the lights are going to be turned out in the studio and you are going to be taking pictures of your classmates drawing and dancing around with the lights. Um, so you might start with a slow shutter speed, maybe a tenth of a second, and then keep on slowing it down or speed it up a little bit and see, try to find that balance where you get an image where the light blurs and you're able to draw with it. Um, I want you to experiment further with using tables or surfaces like a tripod. So what happens if you find that right balance but instead of holding the camera where just your movement is blurring the whole image, you're able to put it on the tabletop and able to make the actual classroom environment look like it's in focus but only the person dancing um, and the light blurred. Um, can, you, can you control that? Um, it's just a few ideas. I mean, it's really fun. I've seen students do this in the past, but you can actually get in groups and spell words out or you can make symbols. I've, I've seen students, you know, able to draw sort of heart symbols or a lot of different symbols. Um, and just a reminder, always a reminder, take a lot of photos. You're not going to get that photo that you really love if you just take, you know, you take one photo for every shutter speed setting. Um, if you, you know, in this, in the course of this 30 minutes, you should be taking a ton of photos, maybe, you know, 40 to 60 photos, maybe more, who knows, but, but don't slow down, take a lot of photos. Make sure you trade off, make sure that everybody gets a chance to take their photos and, and one person doesn't get stuck with the light because you're all going to have you're all going to want to have pictures um, to work with. So uh, after you do this for about 30 to 40 minutes, um, you can get your computers and um, import your, your images. Please be careful around the, around the studio with the computers. I know that you're going, to be, you're going to already have your computers for the slideshow, so make sure you put them away um, and uh, respect the environment. So um, that's pretty much it. I hope that uh, you have some understanding of the concept. I've also attached here a YouTube video of really these same concepts, just in case um, I'm, you know, I'm talking to myself right now, staring at this computer screen, and, and I think I'm making sense. I hope I'm making sense. Uh, 
But if nothing I said makes sense or makes little sense, maybe just watch this YouTube video and see if the person who does this video says it better. Uh, I think some of the things are kind of reiterating what I said, but um, it might just be a kind of a different point of view. And the person has a British accent, so you know maybe that just makes them sound really smart. Um, uh, so if you want to check that out, go for it. And then the last part um, is your photo assignment for tonight. So it's a shutter speed assignment, and what I want you to do is you're going to end up creating one finalized edited photo for each of the following shutter speed goals. So there's four shutter speed goals. There's one, you know, frozen motion, blurred motion, panning, and sort of abstract special effects. Um, I put don't forget about composition. We talked about that earlier. So you're still trying to take a, a composed picture. So think about some of those things that we talked about, you know, review composition in your head a little bit if you want. Um, but the, the four things are frozen motion. So you're going to attempt to freeze something moving fast. So some ideas if you, um, you know, want to take pictures of frozen, of cars moving fast and, and bikes or somebody running, somebody jumping. Maybe you have somebody jumping off a bench and you try to freeze them in the air. So again, you're going to look for that setting, shutter priority. You're going to look for that setting that's going to um, be a fast setting, which is going to allow to, them to be frozen in space. Um, the second one is blurred motion. So moving subject is blurred. Everything else is in, in focus. So you're going to try to take a photo where you're purposely blurring something. Um, the third one is panning. Try to see if you can follow a moving object and have the background blurred. Uh, a little hint here. One, one thing that's really fun just as a, a quick way to kind of get the concept into your head is if you hold your hand out um, at arm's distance, focus your camera on your hand and just spin in a circle. And if you have that slow enough shutter speed, you're gonna be able to get a crisp shot of your hand with the background blurred. That'll really hopefully drive home the concept and then try to, to extend that into maybe panning to blur the background behind a car or um, have someone run sprint by you really quickly and see if you can, if you can pan and get them blurred or get the background blurred and them crisp. Um, again, it's tough, just want you to try it. And then the fourth one is the abstraction special effects. Hopefully, just through today, you have a lot of images you can use for this category, but also tonight, maybe you want to experiment with, um, with blurred lights um, or candlelight at home. Do, you, know, you can do some really cool things with special effects and blurred lights making abstract images. So those are the four areas. Um, kind of back to what we talked about earlier, if you want to take really good photos, you need to take a lot of photos. So for each of these four, think about taking at least you know, 20 photos for each category. Um, you know, that still might not be enough, but at least if you take you know, close to 20 images for each category, hopefully you're gonna get one that you really, really love. And, and, and that's what it's really all about, is you're gonna get an image that you really, really love that you can work with. Um, and then tomorrow's class, you are going to be working in iPhoto importing your images, doing um, some editing, you know, some editing in iPhoto. You hopefully know how to do that from your This I Believe work. And um, I look forward to seeing what you come up with uh, when I'm back next week. So hope you have a great class. Hope you have a great um, Friday and a great weekend. And I will uh, see you next week.